What's cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency is known by most people, but understood by few. Many people fail to understand the basic concepts. In this video, I'll be talking about what Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are, what problem they solve, and why the actual monetary system is failing, as education is the key to the mass adoption to cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology. Hi, my name is Lamia, and welcome to another video of Web3 Crypto. But before we get started, if this is the first time you are visiting my channel, please consider to subscribe, like, and leave a comment. And now let's dive into the video. So what is cryptocurrency? Cryptocurrency is a digital or virtual currency secured by cryptography. Digital currency means that it's not in the form of physical money that you can see or touch. Rather, it's a type of encoded digital form whose record is stored in a million of computers all around the world. Bitcoin is the first widely adopted cryptocurrency. With Bitcoin, people can securely and directly send each other digital money on internet. In order to understand what cryptocurrency and Bitcoin solves, we need to understand how the monetary system started and how it works and why it is failing. So how did all that started? The story began in 1944 when the World War II came to an end. The Allied Nation met at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire to create a new financial system, which would stabilize the world once the war ended. With America poised to enter a golden age of prosperity, the US dollar was chosen as the world's reserve currency. And then this new system, countries agreed to fix their currencies to the US dollar and the US dollar would be tied to gold. This meant that countries around the world could trade their currencies for US dollar, which they could then exchange for gold. This created a system where all currencies are essentially backed by gold to avoid the logistic of shipping physical gold around the world. The US began to run budget deficits as they were running the Great Society program under Lyndon Johnson, and they were fighting a war in Vietnam. In addition, as funding men mission to the moon. With all these new spending programs on the United States, other countries became concerned that the US was spending more money than it had gold reserves. They started exchanging dollars for gold and demanded physical deliveries as they felt that there were more dollars being printed than the gold that backed it. To prevent this outflow of gold from America votes, in the 15th of August 1971, the President Nixon called for an emergency suspension of the gold convertibility system. Nixon's currency is based on the strength of that nation's economy, and the American economy is by far the strongest in the world. Accordingly, I have directed the Secretary of the Treasury to take the action necessary to defend the dollar against the speculators. I have directed Secretary Connolly to suspend temporarily the convertibility of the dollar into gold or other reserve assets, except in amounts and conditions determined to be in the interest of monetary stability and in the best interest of the United States. By removing the link between the gold and US dollar, President Nixon created a system where all currencies were backed by nothing. And this is what we know as fiat currency. The word fiat is a Latin word. It basically means currency that is circulating by force. This means if people have confidence on their currency and there is enough government force that will enable the currency to circulate for a period of time until people lose confidence in the currency. There is no nation in the planet that currently uses money. We all use currency. There will come a day when everybody knows the difference. Money is a medium of exchange. This means something of intrinsic value until the modern age when the politician decided that there are no need of anything of intrinsic value anymore. All we need is a political decree. And so they decided, this is money now. Money has a new characteristic, but underneath it all, there is the same concept in place that nobody ever seems to challenge. And that is the government has the right to declare something of no value to be money. And you must accept it. If you get five pound notes out of your pocket, you will see it says on it, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of five pound signed by the Bank of England. The reason that we think it's worth five pound is that we trust the Bank of England. We trust the UK government. With currencies no longer backed with anything real or tangible, their value was measured only in relation to each other.
countries with relatively weak currencies can make products cheaply. Countries devalue their own currencies to make them desirable trading partners. Without a fixed link to gold, the U.S. Treasury has been able to borrow and spend as much money as it wanted. When the U.S. government needs money, it takes out a loan with the Federal Reserve. Then the Federal Reserve prints the currency required for the loan and in return receives an IOU from the U.S. Treasury. These IOUs are called government bonds. With these IOUs, the U.S. government pays its bill and obligation. Meanwhile, the U.S. Federal Reserve and the Treasury works closely together to sell these bonds at auction where foreign central banks and pension funds and even individuals buy these U.S. government loans. Who wouldn't invest in that? Loaning money to the U.S. government is risk-free. But when time comes to pay it back and plus interest, they can't. So what they do? They borrow more to cover the original loan. So the debt keep going up and up. A real giant Ponzi scheme. With the creation of all this money, that dilutes the value of the dollars that are out there. So that leads to a loss of purchasing power. With inflation rising faster than incomes, people were forced to more and more drastic measures to maintain their standard of living. The average person is forced to borrow well beyond their means, getting themselves deeply into debts. At first, this was to maintain a nice standard of living, but slowly it has become necessary just to survive. By printing more money and devaluating the currency so heavily, the government is forced to tax people. Not only that, there is also what we call a hidden tax. That affects only people who doesn't understand money and they end up paying for it all. So to summarize, why the actual monetary and financial system is failing? Because as the value of the currency drops, the rich get richer and the poor gets poorer. How you get poorer? Each and every day as income and saving gets less valuable, while wealthy people are not storing cash, they are buying assets. That gives them the equity. And this is why financial education is so important. Now let's go back to Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. After 2008 global financial crash, a mysterious white paper emerged from an unknown entity, a person or a group calling themselves Satoshi Nakamoto. The white paper outlined a new peer-to-peer -peer financial system, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system as a title. If you want to read more about it, I'll leave a link in the description below. Unlike banks and other financial institutions, crypto does not require trusted institutions. Everything involved in cryptocurrency is tracked on the blockchain, which is similar to Bank's Ledger, but unlike Bank's Ledger, the Bitcoin blockchain is decentralized. So the transactions processing itself is done by individuals. They record these transactions on the digital ledger, so no companies, countries, or third parties is in control of it. And anyone can be part of the network. So what does Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies solve? Well, it solves many problems. One, the middleman. Unlike services like PayPal, which rely on traditional financial system for permission to transfer money on existing debit or credit card account, Bitcoin is decentralized. Any two people anywhere in the world can send Bitcoin to each other without the involvement of banks, government, or other institutions. Think of it like this. When you go into a coffee shop to buy coffee with your bank card, you don't actually give the money to the cafe owner. The bank does. With digital currencies, there is no bank, no entities or governments. One more problem every payment network has to solve to prevent double spending. And that leads us to number two, double spending. And this is to prevent one entity to spend the same amount twice. Cryptocurrencies are almost impossible to counterfeit or double spend as they are not issued by any central authority making them immune to government interference or manipulation. In decentralized network, you don't have the server. So you need every single entity in the network to do the job. Every peer in the network needs the full list of all transactions to check or if the future transactions are valid or an attempt to double spend. Three, inflation. As we saw earlier, a high inflation rate for fiat currencies leads to the loss of value over time. For example, the money that is stored in a saving account. Bitcoin can be manipulated by government adjusting interest rates or printing money to achieve goals. Like gold and other scarce stores of value to keep Bitcoin scarce, 
and to help maintain its value, the number of Bitcoin that can be minted is capped to 21 million. So what are the advantages of cryptocurrencies? They are portable, divisible, resistant to inflation and transparent. They also have the potential to make it easier to transfer funds directly between two parties without the need for trusted third parties like bank or credit cards companies. Bitcoin, despite not having any application like gold or oil, has intrinsically emerged as a store of value due to its scarcity, durability and security. Take as example, the internet from 1990 to 2000, it grew 63% a year. In 1997, there were 140 million users of the internet. That was the fastest adoption of any technology in the recorded history, prior to the mobile phone, was the other one. If we compare it with crypto, in the year 2021, there are more than 300 million crypto users, and it's growing at 178% a year. That's triple the speed, so it's expected to grow to 1 billion users by 2024. Unbelievable. This means that cryptocurrencies are the fastest adopted technology in the world. El Salvador, the Central American country, has become the first to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. People like Bill Gates, the co-founder of Microsoft Corporation, and Elon Musk, CEO of Tesla, support cryptocurrency. MicroStrategy the largest independent publicity traded analytic and business intelligence company in the world owns Bitcoin. As it is much better and secure than physical money and also holds great feature for the world's economy. Experts believe that blockchain and related technology will disrupt many industries like finance and law. Some think this industry is the future of finance. While we wait for regulators to understand how crypto works, as it's complex and constantly changing, that makes the learning curve extremely steep. Only then they can proceed to regulation. But for this to happen, it will probably take years. But how this will benefit the crypto economy? Well, with the regulation in place comes trust, and trust will help more institutions and organizations to adopt cryptocurrency. Meanwhile, my advice Keep learning and educating yourself. Let's end this video with this amazing quote of H.G. Wells. Civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. I hope you enjoyed today's video. And if you have any question, please leave it in the comment below and I'll make sure to answer it. And for now, see you in the next one.